Chapter 19, The Kinetic Theory of Gases. This is the kinetic theory of gases right here. This is the first time we're looking at underlying microscopic effects to gain a macroscopic understanding of, in this case, pressure, volume, temperature, and internal energy. Everyone has some understanding of pressure, volume, and temperature. The idea of energy possessed by a gas is probably new. So this is going to be an interesting chapter. We're going to gain a much deeper understanding about what pressure pressure, volume, and temperature really are and what they represent. This is absolutely foundational for all of the thermodynamics that follows. Because we're going to be dealing with a lot of tiny particles, we need to put some new tools in our toolkit. Box 1 introduces the mole, Box 2 introduces Avogadro's constant, and Box 3 introduces the atomic mass unit. You might have learned about these terms in an earlier chemistry class. In any event, make sure you really grasp what they are here. Once again, learn as you transcribe. This slide gives you a good perspective. At standard atmospheric pressure and temperature, one mole of ideal gas occupies 22.4 liters of volume. There is a basketball for comparison, and here's a one liter water bottle that we're probably all familiar with. So it turns out at standard atmospheric pressure and temperature, one mole of any substance contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. Carbon-12 refers to the fact that carbon has six protons and six neutrons. A neutron and a proton have pretty much the same mass. A neutron is a wee bit heavier than a proton, but right now we'll consider them to have the same mass. A proton and a neutron are referred to as nucleons. So one twelfth of 12 nucleons is one atomic mass unit. Make sure that you really understand this example for sulfur hexafluoride. You're going to need to often convert between atomic mass units, number of particles, moles, and grams. Here's your conversion toolkit. It ties together the number of moles, the number of particles, which really means the number of atoms or the number of molecules, the mass of an individual molecule or atom, the mass of a given sample. For example, I have a large container of carbon dioxide gas and the mass of that gas in the container equals 14 kilograms. The molar mass of a substance, again, look at the example, one mole of sulfur hexafluoride fluoride has a mass of about 146 grams. So now we come to the ideal gas law. This is certainly a foundational law and it's probably, in my humble opinion, in the Hall of Fame along with maybe four or five other fundamental relationships. The ideal gas law applies when the density is low enough so the gas particles themselves don't react with each other. That's not a super narrow restriction. Most gases are in fact at low enough densities to be subject to the ideal gas law. Here it is, PV equals small n RT or PV equals capital N KT. This is such a fundamental starting point for thermodynamics that we're going to spend a fair amount of time really getting to know this law. The ideal gas law is empirical. It's not something scientists derive, it's something that is observed. It applies unless the gas density is very high. For a given amount of gas, the ideal gas law relates volume, temperature, and pressure. As mentioned, we can live within this density range. The ideal gas law is very widely applicable. Let's go through the version that says PV equals NRT. P stands for absolute not gauge pressure. Gauge pressure refers to the amount of pressure above or below standard atmospheric pressure. You'll need to know gauge pressures from time to time in this course, but in the ideal gas law, P stands for absolute pressure in pascals, which is a newton per square meter. V stands for volume, which is typically given in units of cubic meters, but it could be in liters or any other acceptable unit for volume. Lowercase n stands for the number of moles, and it should be noted that the number of moles could be of a pure gas like this, or a gas mixture. R is the universal gas constant. It's given here in two different sets of units. T stands for temperature and always use Kelvin. The ideal gas law itself is based on Kelvin temperature. For the version of the ideal gas law that says PV equals capital letter NKT, capital N stands for the number of molecules or number of atoms. K is Boltzmann's constant. This is a really fundamental and famous constant. This is a good expression. K 
Ripley is the bridge from macroscopic to microscopic physics. As mentioned, this is the first time we're looking at the underlying microscopic effects that explain macroscopic behavior. Here are some conversion reminders. One pascal is one newton per square meter. One liter is 1,000 cubic centimeters or one thousandth of a cubic meter. Standard atmospheric pressure is 101,325 pascal. Speaking of conversions, I just want to draw your attention to these boxes, one through six, because you need to deal with the number of moles, the number of particles, the mass of a molecule, the mass of a sample, the molecular mass of a substance, and mix them all together in various ways. Here's yet another reminder to use the Kelvin scale anytime you have to plug in temperature in the ideal gas law. Now it's time to derive isothermal work. Let's spend a lot of time on the system you see here in box one. You have a perfectly insulated cylinder sitting on top of a thermal reservoir. A container of tiny lead pebbles known as lead shot is sitting on a piston that moves with no friction in the cylinder. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to remove one lead shot, which is a tiny amount of mass. The piston will therefore rise a teeny tiny amount. Heat will therefore flow into the working substance from the thermal reservoir because if the piston rises, the working substance will tend to cool down, but it's not allowed to cool down because of the thermal reservoir. I wait a long time for everything to cool down, so my pressure, volume, and temperature are all in equilibrium and all homogeneous throughout the working substance. I plot the new pressure and volume values on a PV diagram. I repeat this process over and over again until I've removed each and every one of the lead shot. Here's the resulting PV diagram. In this case, because temperature is constant, my independent variable is V and my dependent variable is P. So that's why you have this hyperbolic curve. Pressure and volume are inversely proportional. This plotted function is called an isotherm. Every point on that isotherm has different pressure and volume values, but their product, the product of PV, is going to equal a constant. If I remove lead shot, the piston rises and the system does work on the environment. Conversely, if I start adding lead shot to the container, the piston lowers and I would say the environment does work on the system. I have to be really formal doing this though. Every time I remove a lead shot, I have to wait a really long time for things to settle down. And then after things do settle down, I can plot that point. Doing it this way allows me to produce a valid plot. If I didn't wait for pressure, volume, and temperature to all settle down, I would produce an invalid graph. I'm starting with the ideal gas law in box number two, rearranging so that I'm isolating P. And in box three, I'm going to plot a few different isotherms. For plotting purposes, I'm just going to call the product of N times R one. You're looking at six different isotherms simultaneously plotted on a single PV diagram. Look at my 100K isotherm. Towards the top left of this isotherm, my pressure value is large and my volume value is low. This is what happens when my piston is moving close to the bottom of the cylinder. Pressure rises and volume decreases, but the temperature is 100 Kelvin. If I go to the far right bottom of this isotherm, my pressure is low, but my volume is high, and this corresponds to the piston being at the top of the cylinder. No matter where I am on this isotherm, the temperature is 100 Kelvin. You also see the 200, 300, 400, 500, and 600 K isotherms. One really helpful takeaway that we can look at right now is, as I go upward or rightward, or a combination of up and to the right, my temperature increases and so does my internal energy. Follow along what's happening in boxes four through eight. Remember, learn as you transcribe. This is the expression used to calculate the work done by an isothermal process. Box 10 says that if volume changes, work occurs. It also says the magnitude of the work equals the shaded area under the isotherm on a PV diagram. Make sure boxes 11 and 12 are making sense to you. Otherwise, you don't really have a fundamental understanding of what's happening. Okay, it's time to formally define the work done by an isochoric process. Isochoric means constant volume. Sometimes it's referred to an isovolumetric process. Heat can be added or removed. The pressure and temperature could change, but the volume remains constant. Even though there are forces, if nothing moves, no work occurs. Box two is our starting point, the definition of work done by a gas. If you don't remember where the expression in box two came from, make sure you go back and review that derivation. If the volume
volume doesn't change, there is no work done during an isochoric process. Heat can enter or leave the system, pressure and temperature can change, but no work occurs because the volume remains constant. Isobaric work. Isobaric means constant pressure. So whatever the gas pressure is, it remains constant because the container is free to expand or contract. Heat could enter or leave the system. Volume and temperature will change, so will internal energy, but pressure remains unchanged. In box one, we're once again starting with the work done by a gas. P is constant, so we can pull it out of the integrand. And box three tells us the work done by an isobaric process. This also corresponds to the area under the isobaric function, also known as an isobar. Time to derive the linkage between collisions and gas pressure. This is the first time we're going to analyze the microscopic underpinnings of a macroscopic property. Let's look at a container of gas. You look at this and you know right away that there's some pressure exerted on the container by these gas particles. Rather than trying to find out what happens with all of those particles simultaneously, we'll look at one particle as it collides with the left side of the wall that you saw right there. Okay, here's my thought process. I know that pressure is force divided by area. I know that force equals ma, that's Newton's second law. I know another expression for Newton's second law is F equals dp dt, where p is momentum. So I'm going to start off by looking at what happens with momentum as that particle collides into that left side wall. If there was ever a time to learn as you transcribe, this is it. Here's how I can formulate the change in that particle's x momentum and the y momentum. Make sure that makes sense to you. Box two is referencing that little small blue cylinder that you see on the bottom left of your screen. That's a super tiny, infinitesimally small differential volume. Box two is using some basic kinematics and geometry to come up with an expression for the volume of that infinitesimally small differential blue cylinder. Box three is using some basic density definition definitions and rearranges to give me an expression for the number of particles in that tiny little blue cylinder. Box number four, we assume on average half the particles are moving to the left towards the left wall and half of them are moving rightward. Box five, so I have an expression for the total mass heading towards the left wall in that little blue differential size cylinder. Box six, I come full circle. Now I have an expression for the change in the x momentum and the change in the y momentum. And again, this is referring to the momentum momentum felt by the walls upon impact with the particles. Box 7, there's Newton's second law, F equals MA, or as mentioned, F equals dp dt, the change in momentum with respect to time. Box 8 is also saying that force equals MA as well as dp dt. Box 9 is isolating for the force. I now know the force acting on that left wall due to the collision with the particles in that blue differential cylinder. Box 10, there it is. Pressure is defined as force per area. I have an expression for force now. I'm just going to divide by area and that is my expression for what pressure really is. Box 11. We know that gas pressure depends on the number of molecules per volume, the mass per molecule, and the speed of the molecules. So ask yourself, what are three ways to increase the pressure of your bicycle tire? You could increase capital letter N by pumping in some more gas. You could use a larger molecule, say sulfur hexafluoride, which has a greater molecular mass as compared to air and you could increase the speed of the molecules by waiting for a really hot day to take a pressure measurement. All three of those microscopic influences has a macroscopic effect that we're calling pressure. Okay, just like we found out what pressure really is from a microscopic point of view, we're going to do the same thing with temperature. We're going to find out what temperature really is from a microscopic perspective. Gas particles have three velocity components. You're looking at two of them here. Box one is basically Pythagorean theorem in three dimensions. Here's a reminder. Let's look at the net velocity of that green gas particle that you see here. It possesses three velocity components, Vx i hat, Vy j hat, and Vz k hat. There's an expression for my net velocity vector in terms of its three i, j, k vector components. Box 2 says there's no distinguishing any vector component from any other vector component. On average, all three vector components have the same magnitude 
in box three, I'm recycling the expression for pressure in terms of its underlying microscopic properties. In step four and five, I'm multiplying by one half and then multiplying by two in creative ways. In box six, I'm replacing the x component of velocity with just a general velocity term, so I'm no longer restricting myself to a single dimension. I do some rearranging in the next box, and I recognize n times one half mv squared. One half mv squared is the kinetic energy for a single particle, so if I multiply by n, I have the total kinetic energy of all of those particles. Box number seven is a pretty big breakthrough. I have an expression for PV. PV is a really common product in thermodynamics. Box eight is a pretty big deal. I can now update my ideal gas law to read PV equals NRT and PV equals capital N KT or two-thirds times the total translational kinetic energy of the particles in the container. In box 9, we formally correlate kinetic energy to temperature. So we arrived at box 10. We now see what temperature really is, again, in terms of underlying microscopic factors. You can say temperature is a measure of a system's kinetic energy. And you can also say kinetic energy is a direct function of temperature. Box 11 are the key takeaways. Interestingly enough, all gas particles have the same average translational kinetic energy. I don't know if that's intuitive to you, but I might have thought that a really large gas particle versus a really small gas particle would have a very different kinetic energy, and it turns out that's not correct. The second bullet is once again reinforcing that the temperature of a gas is the average translational kinetic energy of its particles. So massive particles have the same kinetic energy as smaller particles, which means they have to have lower velocities on average. You see that here. Each one of these particles has the same temperature, so each one of these particles has the same kinetic energy, again, on average. You can see that the large gas particles seem to have a lower average velocity compared to the smaller gas particles, and you can see from this display that that's true. In many ways, this is the culmination of our effort. We now have three different expressions for internal energy. We can also say that internal energy is the kinetic energy of the system. In this case, that refers to translational kinetic energy, but we'll soon expand that to include rotational kinetic energy as well. The internal kinetic energy of a gas depends solely on the gas's temperature. That's not saying that the internal energy equals the gas's temperature, but it is a function function of temperature and only temperature. Those were two critically important derivations. We now have a much better model of what pressure, temperature, and internal energy really represent. We're going to go back to the isochoric process, again also known as the isovolumetric process. This sets the groundwork for a lot of subsequent thermodynamics. We started chapter 18 with specific heat capacity, Q equals mc delta t. You actually did, or will do, a specific heat capacity capacity lab. Q equals mc delta t is typically used for solids and liquids. We have two analogs when we look at gases. Q equals ncv delta t and another one that we'll talk about soon. Here's our system. A perfectly insulated cylinder with a piston that's locked in place. Those pins prevent the piston from moving up or down. The cylinder is sitting on top of a thermal reservoir so heat can flow in or out. Here's another version of the same thing. Thing. These gas particles are contained in a constant volume box. I can add heat and remove heat, thus changing the pressure, temperature, and internal energy, but the volume remains fixed. Make sure this PV diagram makes sense. You can see that pressure changes, but volume remains fixed. Let's briefly go back to this PV diagram showing a bunch of isotherms. If my pressure is changing, but the volume is constant, my temperature is therefore going to change, and thus the internal energy will change as well. So let's use the case where heat is flowing into this constant volume system. The pressure increases, the temperature increases, the internal energy increases. Box number one, experiments show Q equals NCV delta T. C subscript V is referred to as the molar specific heat capacity of a gas at constant volume. Box two, I'm restating the first law of thermodynamics. Box three, I'm just updating the first law of thermodynamics 
dynamics by combining boxes one and two. Box four, because the piston is prevented from moving, there is no change in volume. Box number five, if nothing moves, even though there are underlying forces, no work is done. So box six shows you the updated version for the first law of thermodynamics. I'll say this a bunch of times, so here goes the first time. Because internal energy depends only on temperature, box six is true for an isochord process, an isobaric process, an isothermal process, any kind of process. Try to give this an extra special highlight color. Box seven is a reminder. We already showed that the change in internal energy equals three halves nr delta t. So go ahead and blend box six and box seven to come up with box eight. This definitely deserves a yellow highlight. Capital letter C subscript V is once again the molar specific heat capacity for a gas held at a constant volume. Empirically, this comes out to 12.5 joules per mole. So for example, if I have one mole of helium gas in a box, I need to add 12.5 joules to raise the temperature of that one mole of helium one Kelvin or one Celsius degree. Box nine, an enhanced version of change in internal energy. This bottom expression is just the deltaized version of the top expression. Box 10 is saying this agrees well with real monoatomic gases. We need to talk about diatomic and polyatomic gases as well. Box 11 is repeating a critical point. If a system is held at a constant volume, any heat added to that system is entirely used to increase that system's internal energy. Temperature is the only variable that determines the internal energy of any gas, not pressure, volume, or any type of process that it's subjected to. Okay, we looked at the molar specific heat at constant volume. Now we're going to look at molar specific heat at constant pressure, designated as capital letter C subscript P for pressure. Here's our system, a thermally insulated cylinder with a movable piston. There are no frictional losses between that movable piston and the cylinder walls. The system is sitting on a thermal reservoir. I crank up the temperature knob, some heat flows from the reservoir into the system, and the piston rises. The volume increases, the temperature increases, the internal Internal energy increases, but the pressure remains constant because, again, that piston is free to move without any frictional losses. The shaded area indicated on the PV diagram corresponds to the amount of work the gas has done on its environment. Box number one, we're starting out with this empirical fact. That's another way of saying this equation comes from experiment. It wasn't derived, it comes from the lab. We're using capital letter C, subscript P for pressure because this is a constant pressure process. Box two, there's the first law for the 101st time. Box three, there's my updated version of the first law of thermodynamics that comes from combining boxes one and two. Box four, that's the work done by an isobaric process. You derive that, so make sure you go back and revisit that derivation. Box five is yet another update of the first law of thermodynamics, again, specifically for this isobaric expansion. Box six is identical to box four but look at this substitution. I'm replacing the change in internal energy term with NCV, V for volume, delta T. And you might think, how can I do this? This is not a constant volume process. It's a constant pressure process. But as mentioned, the change in internal energy always equals NCV delta T no matter what. Box number seven, let's use the Swiss Army knife of thermodynamics, also known as the ideal gas law. If PV equals N NRT, then P delta V equals NR delta T for an isobaric process. This basically is the product rule from calculus. At the bottom of box seven is yet another updated version of the first law of thermodynamics, specifically for an isobaric process. Box eight comes directly from box seven. This is a very frequently used relationship between CV and CP. So in box nine, we see that CP is greater than CV. We need to talk about this. Box 10, adding heat energy to a gas during a constant pressure process will tend to increase the internal energy of the gas. If you dump heat into a system, you would expect that system to gain energy, specifically kinetic energy, which is our measure of internal energy. Box 11, the volume of the gas will thus tend to increase in order to keep the pressure constant. Again, that piston is able to move. So if I dump heat into the system, there's going to be an expansion and the pressure is going to remain constant 
constant because the piston is free to move. That expansion comes at a price. Something has got to pay for it. In this case, the gas uses a portion of its internal energy to do this work. So if your goal was to increase the temperature of this gas by a certain amount and that piston is free to move, you have to pay extra. You have to invest more heat to achieve the same increase in temperature and to cover the work done to raise the piston. I'm kind of saying the same thing over and over again because this is a tricky point and understanding it is critical. Box 13 is reminding us if we're adding heat to a system at constant volume, all of that heat goes towards increasing the internal energy of the gas. No work is done, which means you don't have to pay for any work for an isochord process. Lastly, box 14. If you again want to achieve a certain change in internal energy, CP has to be greater than CV because the heat invested not only increases the internal energy but has to also pay for the isobaric work. Let's talk about equal partition of energy. We're going to look at three basic types of gas. A monoatomic gas like helium, a diatomic gas like oxygen, and a polyatomic gas like methane. There are six naturally occurring monoatomic gases. Helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. Think of these as point masses. You know each atom has a nucleus and a cloud of electrons, but right now, think of them as point masses. There are seven naturally occurring diatomic gases. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Think of these as two point masses connected by a massless stick. Here are some polyatomic gas molecules. Carbon dioxide has three atoms, methane has five atoms, and ethane has eight atoms. Let's look at a diatomic molecule. Here's one degree of freedom. Translational motion along the x-axis. Here's a second degree of freedom. Translational motion along the y-axis. A third degree of freedom translational motion along the z-axis. A fourth degree of freedom, this kind of rotation. A fifth degree of freedom, this kind of rotation. A sixth degree of freedom, this type of oscillation, which we pretty much ignore because it only occurs at ultra-high temperatures. So for a diatomic gas molecule, I have five degrees of freedom, three translational and two rotational. For a polyatomic molecule, I have the same two rotational degrees of freedom as does a diatomic molecule, but I also have a third rotational degree of freedom. So altogether for a polyatomic molecule, I have three translational degrees of freedom and three rotational degrees of freedom. The equal partition of energy theorem says that each degree of freedom contributes one half kT joules per molecule or one half RT joules per mole. We need an improved expression for internal energy. Saying internal energy equals 3 halves nRT is okay if we're talking about a monoatomic gas, but we now need to consider monoatomic, diatomic, and polyatomic gases. So we generalize the expression for internal energy as internal energy equals F over 2 nRT, where F represents the degrees of freedom. Similarly, Cv equals 3 halves R is accurate for a monoatomic gas molecule, but but we need to generalize that to CV equals F over 2 times R. As always, CP equals CV plus R. Here are some overarching summary statements. I've mentioned these multiple times already. Make sure you review them again and make sure you learn as you transcribe. Here's a single visual that summarizes a ton of information. It covers molar specific heat capacities for constant volume and constant pressure processes and covers monoatomic and diatomic gas molecules. It also incorporates work contributions and expressions for internal energies. Lastly, it points out the translational and rotational contributions. This is not an at-a-glance visual. You'll need to look at this for a long time and really think on it pretty hard. Here is an all-encompassing summary of degrees of freedom for monoatomic, diatomic, and polyatomic molecules. Okay, last section. We're going to look at 
at adiabatic processes. Here's a reminder of what an adiabatic process looks like. My working substance, which again is my gas, is enclosed in a perfectly insulating cylinder. Instead of being placed on a thermal reservoir, the cylinder is placed on an insulating base. This means no heat can flow in or out of my system. The other adiabatic situation is when the process happens so fast there's simply not an opportunity for heat to flow in or out of the system. The piston can rise and fall, which means there could be positive work or negative work. Pressure, volume, and temperature all change, but again, there's no heat flowing into or out of the system. I'm going to remove one lead shot, one teeny tiny lead pebble from that container. The piston will rise, and because there's no heat flowing into the system, again adiabatic, my volume will increase, my pressure will decrease, my internal energy decreases, and my working substance has done positive work. These changes are super small. They're differential, infinitesimally small, because I'm removing only one teeny tiny lead pebble. Once removed, I let everything calm down and take a measurement of all of these variables. Box one, when I remove only one tiny lead pebble, my change in volume is infinitesimally small, that's why I'm using dV as the integration variable. Box two says adiabatic means no heat comes in or goes out. Box three, that's my first law. Change in internal energy equals Q minus W, Q equals zero, so this is what I end up with. Box four, the differential work equals P times dV. We're assuming for a super small change in volume, the pressure remains constant. Box five is reminding us for the 10th time that internal energy always equals NCV delta T, or the differentialized version, DE equals NCV DT. Box six results directly from boxes four and five. Box seven, we're differentialized the ideal gas law, again because we're dealing here in the differential realm, and boxes 8 through 15 show additional manipulations that all follow from starting with the first law and applying the ideal gas law. Make sure you go through all of them in horrible detail. We introduce a really special variable in box 11, gamma. Gamma is known as the heat capacity ratio. It's the ratio of CP over CV. The ratio of CP over CV is so common in thermodynamics, we use gamma to represent it. Box 16 shows the adiabatic pressure volume relationship. The product of pressure and volume is the same anywhere along an adiabat. Look what I'm doing in box 17 to get to box 18. This is the adiabatic temperature volume relationship. The product of temperature and volume is the same everywhere along an adiabat. Reminder, when I remove a lead shot, one teeny tiny lead pebble, the volume is going to increase and I will experience expansion cooling because heat cannot flow into my system. This is why you see this adiabat falling from a higher to lower isotherm. Lastly, time to derive adiabatic work. Boxes 1 through 4 show a pretty straight forward path to box 5, the expression for work done during an adiabatic process, which is the area under an adiabat on a PV diagram. As an aside, you never really need to use this expression, at least at our level. If Q equals zero, then the change in internal energy equals work, and the change in internal energy is always N C V, V like volume, delta T. So adiabatic work equals what you see in box five, and it also equals negative N C V delta T. You might need this expression in box five, better safe than sorry. Here's a really useful summary table that Iris, one of my former students, came up with. A lot of the content in these lecture notes comes from students, so please feel free to suggest modifications or new additions that you think of.